Welcome tonight, everybody, to Better Together for Successful Schools in 2021. Um, here we are already the end of February 2021. This uh, series has uh, was imagined by all of our medical uh, partners and community partners um, at UCSF, Stanford Children's Health, San Mateo County Health, and the San Mateo County Office of Education. Um, this is our first webinar in the 2021 school year. We um, thought we might have one in January, but uh, January was a very busy time. So here we are in the end of February kicking us off. So the idea of the Better Together series, the vision for this series is that certainly the COVID-19 pandemic has presented us with enormous challenges. I was saying to someone the other, night if I hear unprecedented times one more time up. Um, I, I can like put that phrase away for the rest of my life, I think. Um, anyway, we've got enormous challenges every day. One of the biggest impacts of this pandemic has been on um, the academic, emotional, and social well-being of our children and the ways in which our schools play such an important role in our community. So in order to support our young people and our schools, um, it's imperative that we join forces. Um, I think post pandemic, we should be working um, linked arms all the time with education, public health, academia, and community health. So this isn't something we should only do in emergencies, right? So, but the, the need has never been greater for us to come circle up around our students and our schools with the idea that we are better together. So tonight um, we're gonna be having a discussion about uh, COVID-19 vaccinations. And with the idea that we are helping move our schools forward, I think you'll find um, the conversation really interesting, informative, and hopefully you come away with some new understandings about how we're operating here in San Mateo County across the state, and uh, just in general, more knowledge about how vaccinations work. However, before we go into the program, um, I think it's really appropriate tonight that we just take a moment to remember that um, while we're very hopeful and optimistic about the future, with even another new vaccine being um, approved just yesterday, in the last year, we've lost 500,000 Americans, family members, parents, brothers and sisters, children, community members, community leaders, and it's an unprecedented, well, there you go. I just used that word. It's a, it's a historic, tragic milestone in our American history. So this week we've been flying our flags across the country at half mast in remembrance. And I would just right now like to take about 30 seconds of silence before we proceed with the program in honor of all those we've lost. Thank you for that. Moving on with the program tonight, we, um, we have some amazing experts with us and community partners so generous with their time and energy. Um, we will hear from Dr. Monica Gandhi, who is the professor of medicine and associate chief of the Division of HIV Infectious Diseases and Global Medicine at UCSF. Um, honored to have Dr. Anand Chabra with us tonight, Medical Director 
of Family Health Services with the San Mateo County Health System. One of our um, Better Together partners and leaders is Dr. Neil Patel, community pediatrician um, with our um, Palo Alto Medical Group. And we also have with us another leader with our Better Together series is Dr. Curtis Chan, who serves as the deputy health director with the San Mateo County Health System. We also have joining us in the panel, um, Dr. Jim Howard, who's done so much to support the work of moving schools forward in, in uh, this pandemic. Uh, Dr. Howard is both a Belmont Redwood Shore school board member and also a pediatrician um, and um, helped so much with uh, preparing for tonight's presentation. So uh, tonight our program will be these opening remarks. Um, we will hear from Dr. Gandhi um, if um, she's been able to join us. Um, we will have a conversation with Dr. Anand Chabra um, and then hear closing remarks from Dr. Patel and Dr. Chan. Just putting it on your radar and your calendars that our next Better Together webinar event is scheduled for Tuesday, March 16th. We have not yet set a topic for that because um, topics are so dynamic in the pandemic. We really don't know what will be the most important thing for us to hear about at that point. Um, we certainly know that um, for February 25th, the most important thing is um, hearing about vaccinations. So uh, a little bit of um, um, business here before we get started on the format. We, um, we are not using the question and answer um, feature at all tonight. Um, we will simply focus and listen um, to the conversations and the discussion. And, um, uh, and that way we can really uh, focus in and leverage the expertise of our guests. And um, I do believe that Dr. Gandhi has, uh, is joining us now as we speak. Perfect timing, Dr. Gandhi, you know how to make an appearance. So we were just getting to your, just getting to your session. So let's see if she makes it over here to this side of the window. Do we see? There we go. Going to give her a chance to take a breath. <laughs> no, sorry about uh, being late. I was in clinic, so I apologize to everyone. And I'm no, ready. And we are, we're just so grateful to have you with us tonight. We know that you were also uh, in front of a big audience last night giving a similar talk. So for you to give up your evenings like this for the benefit of the education community is really quite amazing. I'm um, very excited about these vaccines. I want to tell people about them. That's great. So <laughs> I just gave a little bit of an introduction about the program tonight. And um, I am, let's see, I guess as a panelist, you're able to go ahead and okay. share your screen when you're ready. But um, Dr. Gandhi is the professor of uh, medicine and the associate chief of the division of HIV infectious diseases and global medicine at UC San Francisco. She's going to provide us with sort of the foundational knowledge about vaccines that will really help us kick off our discussion tonight. So Dr. Gandhi, again, so grateful to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I want to talk about the vaccines because um, they 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 are pivotal to when we think about school openings and and what's going on right now, even with the decreasing cases and uh, around the uh, the state. That really part of this is vaccines. So I want to talk about vaccines and their mechanisms. I want to talk about immune responses and what's important. Um, I want to talk about uh, what were the outcomes of the trials that are relevant to us, because though there are eight vaccines out there, there are two approved and one coming in the United States. And then I want to talk about the uh, evidence on vaccines decreasing asymptomatic infection and thereby transmission. 
I want to really tell you not to worry about the variants, and I want to explain that uh, explain why, despite the news. And then um, I want to talk about what you can do after vaccination. So, you know, there are actually eight uh, studies. There are eight vaccines that have phase three clinical trial data uh, this soon after the pandemic. It's incredible progress. But the three that I'm going to talk about today are actually um, the Moderna, the Pfizer, and the Johnson & Johnson, because these are the ones that are in our country are going to be approved in our country. Now, um, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, have, we have peer-reviewed publications for. Uh, they're both published in the New England Journal, and I give the links there. But the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, we just, we don't have a peer-reviewed publication, but the FDA just released the public document yesterday. So we got quite a bit of detail on this, and I'm sure it'll be coming out soon, and uh, it's likely to be authorized on Friday. So of those eight vaccines, two of them are actually inactivated viral vaccines, but those aren't the ones that are here. So let's talk about the other six vaccine candidates. They all use a particular mechanism. And what they do is they either code for or give you the protein of what's called the spike protein. So if you think about the virus, you think of the cell, the virus is connecting with the cell with that spike protein. And all of these vaccines either code for or give you the spike protein, this thing that sticks out and connects with your host cell. It turned out this was the right uh, <laughs> a moiety to develop vaccines against because they're so incredibly effective. So let's remember what the mechanism is then of the two vaccines that we have and the one that's coming. Well, of the three types of vaccines that involve that spike protein, that are, there are two what are called mRNA vaccines. And what mRNA vaccine means, and you've heard so much about this in the news, but it's unusual because we've never had a pathogen um, a vaccine that's an mRNA vaccine before now. Where they, they've, it's been tried in tumor uh, vaccine trials. But it's actually a, a very interesting concept, which is not giving the protein to you, which is a lot of how vaccines are. They're giving you the protein or they're giving you the, the vaccine itself, uh, in, uh, the virus itself inactivated. It's actually giving um, the mRNA that codes for the spike protein surrounded by this lipid nanoparticle that's injected in your arm, the mRNA goes inside your cells and you're used to uh, seeing mRNA and, and to produce protein. So your very own cell produces from that mRNA, the spike protein of the virus, the mRNA then degrades, goes away. And that spike protein of the virus looks unusual to your body. They haven't seen it before and they develop and mount an effective immune response against that spike protein. Those are the Pfizer and Modernas. The Johnson & Johnson that's being reviewed on Friday is what's called an adenovirus DNA vaccine. And what that is, is it, it needs some way to get inside the body. So it's actually a virus, a cold virus, a simple cold virus that doesn't replicate in your body called an adenovirus. And inside there is DNA. And then that DNA, that adenovirus gets injected in you, it, go, it goes away and then that becomes the vector. The DNA gets inside your body and then you actually produce from that DNA. Um, the spike protein and mounted immune response. And though that's the Johnson & Johnson. It's also AstraZeneca and Sputnik V vaccines. And then there's one called Novavax, which is actually the protein. So I know that this is going back to our biology, but it, it's really important to remember um, the immune response that develops within your body against a vaccine. Because when you hear these words antibodies, that's only one piece of the vaccine response. And in fact, it's a very minor piece. Um, uh, B cells, there are two arms of your immune system, B cells, T cells, B cells produce antibodies, and those go up with, with vaccination, but after a while they'll go down. It's actually what's important is your T cell response. T cells are divided into two flavors. There's the CD8 cells, which are called killer cells, CD4 cells, and those are the main cells in your body that provide immune defense against viruses, and they last. They last a long time. Pertussis, you have all have in your bodies right now, if you got a pertussis vaccine when you were a children, you have T cells um, that responded against that pertussis vaccine, even if your antibodies went away. T cells are what are gonna give us durable immunity to um, the, the coronavirus uh, long after. And it's also important when I tell you about why I don't want you to worry about the variants, because T cell responses, um, are very in breadth and they're gonna work against all the variants, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, so these are the six 
vaccines that uh, are involved with spike protein. Let's ignore those bottom three, even though they're very interesting because they're not in this country. Let's think about those top three and let's remember what the clinical trial data showed us. They've been, they've been tested in large populations, half got vaccine, half got saline, some salt water. And the Moderna and the Pfizer already told you are the mRNA vaccines. Johnson & Johnson is an adenovirus with DNA. Moderna and Pfizer are two doses. Johnson & Johnson is one dose. And this is what's important, column four. When you look at the phase one, two trial data of these vaccines, they produced neutralizing antibodies. They produced really strong T cell responses. That's what's gonna get us through this. Um, and they're the right T cell responses. They're the exact right CD4 cell that we want. Um, they were studied in large populations. Importantly, uh, the Johnson & Johnson, someone told me today, there may be more trust in communities because it was studied in large communities in different parts of the world. So it was studied in the US, Latin America, and South Africa. These other two were mostly US participants. And the protection from hospitalization across all the vaccines is 100%. And I, I really mean that, like it sounds too good to be true, but the people who got hospitalized with COVID, they all got salt water. Anyone who got a vaccine was protected 100% from hospitalization. There was one person who transiently went into the hospital um, between one and, one and two doses from Moderna. So essentially it was almost 100% protection from hospitalization. Then when you get into the other disease categories, severe disease at home, but you're not hospitalized, you're at home, not feeling well, or mild disease, which usually manifestations as, as cold-like symptoms, that's when the differences occurred uh, in efficacy across the vaccine trials. So for example, in severe disease, uh, again, uh, the Moderna, uh, oh, sorry, Johnson & Johnson and uh, Pfizer were very effective against severe disease. There wasn't a single person who had severe disease, who was in the vaccine trial, uh, vaccine arm. But in the Johnson & Johnson trial across South Africa, Latin America, and the US, uh, they called people severe disease, even the people who, who didn't need to be go seek hospitalization. And it was 85% effective across for severe disease across all three sites. And this is what I really wanna remind you. The South Africa site, 95% of the viruses circulating at that time, were the B1351, was the so-called South Africa variant. Uh, the 69% of the circulating viruses um, at that time in Brazil were the P2 variant. So this is, um, this is this was studied against the variants and it was very protective against um, what got us into trouble with SARS-CoV-2 to begin with is that people can get sick. Um, it is against mild disease that the variability is there. <coughs> uh, for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, 72% sorry, effective in the US and 57% effective in South Africa. So the mild disease efficacy varied across sites. Dr. Gandhi, just, uh, I hate to interrupt, but we have a, a Spanish translator. Oh. Uh, so uh, if you could just, uh, when you just slow down, just a one speed, one gear a little bit for that translator to Try to Thank you. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that. I'm going to do that. And I'm also going to say less verbal words. I'm going to say <laughs> no, fewer right. words, let yeah. you look at the slides. <laughs> and uh, so to help translation. Thank you. Um, to just, I already said this, but I, I want us to love the T-cells. I want us to think about them all the time because these are really the responses that uh, blocked severe disease. And the reason that's so important is T-cells are durable. Uh, and, and they will last a long time. And so don't let people think that we're gonna uh, need to, to update this every year and I'll explain that later, but T cells last a long time. And they also are the cells that protect you from getting very sick, from getting down into the body, getting into the lungs and getting sick. Okay, so let's give a few more details on the clinical trials but I'm not gonna give you much. I just wanted to remind you of the demographics. When you say, well, was it not studied in older people? Was it not studied in uh, people who um, are across different um, uh, demographic groups? I wanna just tell you the data so that you have for yourself what, it, what these trials, uh, what participants look like in these trials. The Pfizer vaccine trial uh, enrolled many participants. It's two shots three weeks apart. Of the people who we have the data for that were reported on in this New England Journal paper, 
50% were female, 82.9% were white, and 28% were Hispanic Latinx community, communities. So maybe it wasn't as, as well good as we wanted for diversity, but it was better diversity than usual. And 21% 21 were over 65 years old. So there were older people. And importantly, there were also people who could get very sick because they had comorbidities. 35% had obesity. And then there were other comorbidities of diabetes and pulmonary disease. Despite all of that, the vaccine performed spectacularly. As we already said, it is 95% effective across all types of disease and 100% effective for getting, for getting severe disease, 100%. Okay, in terms of safety with the Pfizer vaccine, you're going to feel it more than you feel your flu shot. I cannot tell you otherwise. It is causes high amounts of injection site reactions, 80% feeling pain at the site. And uh, the other reactions were all mild. The only ones that there was more frequency, 2% frequency or above was fatigue and headache. And this is the one that needs to be stored at very cold temperatures, very cold, negative 70. The company said last week that we can store it at less cold temperatures, negative five to negative 13, but it's still very cold. It's not a usual fridge. What about the Moderna vaccine? This also was a large population, two shots, four weeks apart. It uh, enrolled 25% of uh, were over 65 years old. So, uh, and 36.5% uh, were participants from communities of color. So more representation than we usually get. And there again were uh, this participants had uh, high obesity uh, high, uh, and, and other high risk conditions like lung disease and heart disease. And in terms of its efficacy also amazing 94% efficacy, and again, 100% efficacy against severe disease. There was one person who had a very transient hospitalization in the vaccine group, but they had, didn't have time. It was uh, uh, right after their first dose. They probably hadn't had the immune response yet. So I call this essentially 100% efficacy against severe disease. Anyone who went into the hospital had gotten the, the placebo shot from COVID. Its safety is, you're gonna have more local reactions with uh, Moderna, they are more. Um, they are about 94%, but um, they're bearable and, uh, and the other reactions last about a day, which is muscle aches and headache and uh, joint aches. And one good thing about Moderna is that you can store it in the fridge for longer, about 30, 30 days in a regular fridge, which makes it easier. And then finally, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Again, we just had the FDA report, 40, very, very diverse patient population in the sense that it, it enrolled across Latin America, the US and South Africa. And over a third were over 60 years old and large population Hispanic and or, and or Latinx because of the Latin America uh, component. And also a lot of comorbidities, 41% had comorbidities. There were a lot more cases of COVID-19, symptomatic COVID in this uh, trial. It was a very large trial. Again, 100% effective against hospitalizations and deaths. There were 16 hospitalizations and uh, seven deaths from COVID, and they were all in the people who got the saline shot. And it was 85% effective where you didn't have to go to the hospital, but you were at home, but you didn't feel well. And, uh, and that was, again, equally across all the sites and equal efficacy against severe disease, even where the variants were circulating. 95% of the South Africa viruses at the time were the B1351 variant. Actually, it didn't have a lot of uh, uh, side effects. In fact, there were more side effects reported in the placebo arm than there were in the vaccine arm. And the important thing here, one dose. And one thing I wanna mention is if you look back at the phase one, two trials, and look at antibodies and its immunogenicity, they only looked at outcomes in Johnson & Johnson two to four weeks after, um, after people got the vaccine. But if you look at the immune response after getting the vaccine in the phase one trials, the immune response kept on going up and up and up and up and it kept on going up for 60 days. So it's probably likely to affect you even have better protective efficacy 
if we could have waited, say, four weeks before we looked at outcomes, but everyone was in a hurry. And Friday is the, the, the FDA review. Last two topics, do vaccines re decrease transmission? Yes, they do. Um, and I can say this now, um, we used to say the phrase, I don't know if they decrease transmission because what happened in the clinical trial designs is that they said, if you don't feel well, come and get swabbed and we'll tell you if you have COVID. They looked at symptomatic COVID. They did not swab people regularly. Why? Again, they were in a hurry. We needed to get these vaccines out fast. But there was no reason to believe that they wouldn't stop asymptomatic infection in the nose. And in fact, there are four reasons to know that they're going to stop asymptomatic infection. And then I'm going to tell you that we now have data that they stop asymptomatic infection. One is that the antibodies that are produced um, by the vaccines, they go happily into the nose, they're, they're IgG antibodies, and they go happily in the nose and they block replication there. The second is that the specific antibody that we call the IgA immunoglobulins that like to help us with no nasal defenses are also activated by systemic vaccinations. Third is when we give those monoclonal antibodies when people need outpatient treatment, it, it clears the virus from your nose um, when you give that monoclonal antibody. So of course a vaccine antibody would clear it from your nose. And then the fourth reason is that macaques, when they studied these in macaques, they gave uh, the primates, they gave the vaccine, they then challenged them again with another virus. They would start to replicate in their nose and then their immune defenses would come in and block it and they couldn't get it in their nose. So again, there's every reason to believe it would block asymptomatic infection. And now we have the data because even though the trials weren't designed that way, um, the, uh, the data has come out since from the real world rollout program. Um, this is a New England Journal paper. I didn't get to, a chance to update it. This was just published yesterday in the New England Journal. This was the uh, preprint of this, that 500,000 people vaccinated across Israel with the Pfizer vaccine. They have a deal with the company. So they're vaccinating very quickly uh, with the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, they saw the same level of efficacy uh, in the real world rollout of the Pfizer vaccine than they saw in the clinical trials. That's pretty amazing. We don't usually see every the real world looking like clinical trials, but these are very effective vaccines. So the same decrease in symptomatic and asymptomatic infection. Israel, which is rolling out vaccine incredibly fast, um, are seeing their cases plummet. And anyone who has had the vaccine, which they've, uh, uh, they've actually um, vaccinated 90% of their over 60 year olds, they are not in the hospital any longer. The people who are being hospitalized for COVID-19 are people who have not received the vaccine. And finally, this is from the Lancet. Uh, this looked at healthcare workers who had gotten the Pfizer vaccine in uh, Israel. And in this case, they swabbed their noses because they had time. This was where the real world rollout. So they swabbed them every two weeks. And both symptomatic and asymptomatic infection uh, were decreased by similar percentages, 15 to 28 days after getting just the first dose, not two doses, just the first dose, 85% reduction in asymptomatic and symptomatic infection. Pretty amazing. And then um, the same data came in out of London, uh, sorry, London, not in, uh, London, but England, vaccinated healthcare workers, swabbed them every two weeks, uh, and not only does, uh, do you not get COVID uh, uh, with symptoms, but the asymptomatic infection um, in the nose decreased massively by 86% <clears throat> after two doses. So it does block asymptomatic infection, which is of course uh, means that it blocks transmission. Uh, other data just shows us what, how does it do that? Well, the viral load after vaccination, if you get exposed, you will start to try to produce virus uh, in your nose and replicate, and then the immune system comes swooping in and stops that viral load from replicating. So there's actually um, very low viral loads in the nose uh, after vaccination if you are exposed. And let me tell you finally about the variants. These are these names you know, that they've come up with because that's where they were discovered. We have a California variant. Now there's a New York variant. There was a South Africa, a Brazil, a um, uh, a, a UK variant, but they actually all should and do have uh, formal names. And the reason, uh, and, and we're seeing some variants in this country, but the reason that I don't want you to worry about the variants is this, um, forget about the fact that actually the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have already shown us 
that they can produce neutralizing antibody titers high enough to neutralize these variants. Forget about that. Let's think about the T cells again. Let's go back to the T cells, and then I'll come back to this. The T cells, and these are two very good papers, create a very um, uh, in breadth and um, complicated immune response against the entire spike protein, against multiple segments of the spike protein. So if you have mutations in the spike protein, your T cells are still created that span the entire spike protein. And you still have T cell responses that will work and will fight the variants, even if you see a new type of virus. And importantly, this happened in England. They said, oh no, B117 is gonna be terrible where everyone who's had the virus before is going to get B117 and they are going to have reinfection. They did have a few reinfections, but they were all asymptomatic because the T cells come swooping in and protect you from severe disease. And so the reason I don't want you to worry about the variants is mRNA viruses do this. They, uh, sorry, RNA viruses do this, they mutate. It's actually not mutating that fast. Um, uh, we notice these variants, but influenza has a much faster rate of mutation. Uh, T cell responses, B cells, they all worked even when the variants were circulating in the Johnson & Johnson trial. And then finally, if God forbid, there is a variant that our immune system can evade in the future, as you know, and you've already heard, we can make vaccines that work against those variants. So finally, um, uh, why are we still masking and distancing, of course? Well, we wanna do this right now, and this is very relevant for the school setting um, because some are vaccinated, some are not, and we are in a setting where um, if uh, in, in open schools that we still have uh, many uh, th those who are unvaccinated, these three pillars of the non-pharmaceutical interventions to reduce risk, so-called mass uh, NPIs, we call them, but masks, distancing, ventilation, there's no magic to any of them. If one gets better, then the other can go down. For example, we don't recommend masking, double masking or increasing your masking outside because the ventilation is wonderful outside, right? And so that's why simple cloth masks are worn outside. If distance is not perfect between individuals um, and not a very high distance, the WHO says three feet, CDC has said six feet, um, then we can use masks that protect us better. And so the CDC paid attention to this question about better masks and the recommendation, and I'll just put it really simply because they actually put a very complicated graphic in their paper with like pantyhose options. And I, just, I don't want people to be pantyhose. It's, too, it's, it's two, two options and they're super simple if you wanna increase mass protectiveness and have a mask that looks just like an N95 in terms of blocking 95% of viral particles. It's either a surgical plus a cloth mask together, which blocks 95% of viral particles, the surgical mask blocks it electrostatically and the cloth mask blocks it from the fibers. Or you could take one of those masks that have a filter pocket and the filter pocket inside that filter that you put inside combined with the cloth blocks 95% of viruses. So these are very um, impressive mask options. Um, and I think N95s are very uncomfortable. And so I, these two are other mask options to increase our masking as we're waiting to be vaccinated. And oh, this is only for adults when we're indoors. And then finally, I've kind of convinced you, I hope that these vaccines are amazing. And that means when we get there, people will mingle. I mean, this we're not gonna have mass and distancing forever. Vaccinated and vaccinated people, it's probably as safe as you can get. I mean, mingle, hang out, be together. I'm See your parents if you're vaccinated and your parents are vaccinated, please see them. Um, vaccinated around unvaccinated, there's a social norm. You may, you may not be able to transmit it and I don't think you will be able to transmit it as I already told you the data to an unvaccinated person, but some people are unvaccinated. There's gonna be social norms. We're gonna keep that masking and distancing until we're all, we get to herd immunity. And I think that's fair unvaccinated and unvaccinated, you're still at risk. Um, and so I think that tiered messaging is important and what you choose to do with other vaccinated people, feel free. I think that in this country, we are really messaging poorly about how vaccines are gonna get us out of this pandemic and how we're going to be free to mingle once again. We're doing a horrible job, we're scaring people, we're talking about variants, we're not talking about T cells, we're talking about we're going to talk about masks in 2022. This is inaccurate. This is how they're messaging in Europe. 
I, this is a health official. This is like your, um, this is like the, the head of the health official in, in um, chief scientific advisor in EU. He says, I get vaccinated to protect, to go see my dad and to have a family weekend get together. That is what vaccines are gonna do. They are gonna get us out of this pandemic. And I will stop there and take any questions. Wow, thank you, Dr. Gandhi. That is a, a ton of really great information, very much on the optimistic side, right? Because um, it's true. Yeah, and this one is of- data, I'm just pretty reporting data. <laughs> that's right. And so, um, you know, one of the questions people are asking is, which, which vaccine should I get? And it seems like you're uh, touting um, any one that you can possibly get is a good vaccine. Is that? You know, right? Dr. Warner Green is a, um, a kind of famous scientist at our institution. He said, even with the South Africa variant, Johnson & Johnson protects you from severe disease, having to go to the hospital and die. And frankly, that's what you want from a vaccine. That is fantastic. You may have a runny nose or a mild upper respiratory tract infection, but you're not going to develop life-threatening pneumonia and require hospitalization. And I'd sign up for that vaccine any day. And I completely agree. Great, thank you. Um, just for those of us who are still, um, who are sort of English majors and not, not leading with the science language, can you talk a little bit about what herd immunity actually means? Yes, what it means is we're gonna see two things. And by the way, we're already seeing them, um, right? Um, uh, but we're gonna see two things happen with the rollout of the vaccine. We're going to see decrease in hospitalizations. And you can argue that um, even what right now is happening as we've been vaccinating more and more people, I think about 25% of Californians are vaccinated. Um, uh, we, of course, are seeing massive decrease in hospitalizations and cases from the surge, uh, from the winter surge. I think we had 4,500 cases in California today from a peak of 52,000. So these, these is not, not just because we're staying away from each other, because if you look at the curve of how surges go, usually it's kind of this long curve of coming down. The cases and hospitalizations are going down much more fast than we thought, partially because of immunity, not just from the vaccines, but from some partial uh, natural immunity from getting infected. If you looked at the curves in the UK and Israel, which are doing a much better job than we are about rolling out vaccines because they have more options, they have, a, they have an AstraZeneca, so they have an adenovirus equivalent, so they're moving much more quickly. Um, th their curves are like, like almost like this, like no one's in the hospital who's gotten the vaccine. So um, we are going to see that first. The hospitalizations are going to go down in back among vaccinated populations. And then why do the cases go down? It's because of herd immunity. It means that... Um, the virus is trying to run around and it's trying to find you and it, it, it literally keeps on coming across vaccinated individuals, people who cannot take in the virus and get sick and they cannot pass it on to others as I've just shown you by the data. And so as more and more of us are vaccinated, then more, the virus, uh, a big crowd, there'll be so many people in that crowd who are non-immune. I mean, a, a, a non-immune, there'll only be a few people in that crowd and the, vir and the virus literally can't find the person to infect. That's what herd immunity means. So the UK, for example, has already estimated that by May 12th, they are gonna allow a thousand people gathering inside um, and 10,000 people gathering outside. Why? Because they're looking at their models, they're moving fast and they are free to say on May 12th, I'm, we're gonna have a concert for a thousand people because the virus cannot find people when you vaccinate quickly. And so I, I, I keep on thinking to myself, so let's stop thinking about anything else but vaccinating as quickly as we can. Right. Um, way back when the uh, when the governor and the legislature were trying to figure out what's the fastest way to get schools open, my suggestion was vaccinate educators. Spend I all think your it was a very smart suggestion doing that. And uh, so here we finally got into that. Um, I'm going to ask a <clears throat> sort of a personal question. I'm a new grandmother. Um, my daughter-in-law just had a baby on January 9th. She's, uh, she's now breastfeeding and she's also a, an early learning, uh, 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 preschool director. So, um, what advice do you have for pregnant and nursing parents, um, around vaccine? Yeah, this is an excellent question. Um, so Though the FDA has told us for the last two years that we should enroll pregnant and breastfeeding people into trials, they just didn't. And I'm so sorry about it. And they just didn't. And so three things. 
One is that Pfizer just opened up a 4,000 person uh, trial for pregnant women. It's, you see it's a low number because it's just to assess safety. Uh, number two, there is nothing about this vaccine that would concern me during pregnancy biologically. The mRNA vaccine, um, you know, this piece of mRNA comes into your body, you make the protein and then it just degrades, it goes away. It cannot get into your genetic material, it cannot cross over to a fetus. It just goes away. It, it, it's not going to have, what I'd be concerned about in pregnant women is live virus, um, which is why we don't recommend uh, live viral vaccines in pregnancy. So the biology of it itself makes me feel very safe about it for pregnant and breastfeeding women. And given that pregnancy is a risk factor for more severe, can be a risk factor for having more severe COVID, I am highly recommending it to my pregnant and breastfeeding patients and community. Wow, that's uh, great information. I'm going to pass that along inside the family. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then definitely go see your, if you're vaccinated, remember, we can visit the vaccinated. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm going to be last in line here in San Mateo okay. County, but um, All right. okay. <laughs> I know there, there will be a person who's last in line here because we're going to get everybody taken care of. Yes. Yeah. So um, do any of our um, esteemed uh, guests have any questions for Dr. Gandhi? Dr. Howard? Yeah, well, uh, uh, again, Monica, thanks for coming. Uh, it's so, so awesome to hear you speak. Um, Thank you. The, one of the questions that often comes up is um, after vaccination, um, how long does it take to become effectively vaccinated? And when is it considered um, that you are fully vaccinated? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So you know, we, we are traditionally saying wait 14 days after the second dose to go crazy um, because the immune response still goes up uh, after the second dose. But I was very impressed by the real world data from that healthcare study that I just told you in Israel, which is after one dose, there was 85% protection by day 15. Um, they looked between days 15 and 28. So, and that's of course, before you got the second dose because the trials were confounded that they got the second dose really quickly. So they estimated it was 52% efficacy between do doses one and two, but you can't tell that unless you look at someone after the first dose and really follow their outcomes before they get the second dose and the real world rollout, there's some delays. And so they could tell people oh, it looked like by 28 days, you had 85% efficacy after the first dose. But I'd say 10 to 14 days after the second dose, you're fully immune um, because that's when they looked at the outcomes and that's when they got these profound efficacy rates. I do think by what I told you about Johnson & Johnson though, that the efficacy would have been better if they had measured four weeks after, if they had looked at outcomes four weeks after instead of 15 to 28 days by what the phase one trial data look like. And in the real world, I bet Johnson Johnson's gonna look even, it's gonna protect even better than disease. Remember, we, we hurried with these, everyone's hurrying with these trials and getting them out to get the data out. And then I just wanna add one more personal note and that is that you've actually made my night because you talked about live music and being together in a concert venue, which has been the one thing that has been so painful for me personally. Um, yes, so that is so exciting and hopeful. It's going to happen. I mean, I keep on looking at the UK because they've, they unlike the US, they've put it in place. They tell us. <laughs> so if you wanted to drive to the, or you have to fly, I guess, May 12th, um, you can go to a live concert of a thousand people in the UK. And then June 12th is when they say it's going to be wide open. And this is their estimates based on their modeling. If you go fast enough, they say wide open. They're, I mean, no mass sitting around weddings. They, they told people to plan their weddings on after June 12th. This is, well, this is the release of the lockdown. That's what a release of a lockdown looks like really when you can cool. model, when you, when you go fast. Yeah, great. So um, Dr. Gandhi, we, we <laughs> just can't thank you enough for you sharing this information, especially for our education workforce who's uh, actively getting vaccinated <laughs> right now. Um, and Great. there's a whole new spirit of, uh, of hope in our county 
um, about what, what we can accomplish going forward. I think we're gonna see many, many of our schools back in session before the end of the school year, which is something that's also really great to hear. That's so great. You need, you need, you know, between first one, two doses. I mean, it certainly is before the end of the school year when people are fully protected, so. That's great. So um, thank you so much. You're welcome to uh, stay on and listen in, or if you've got other, I know you've got lots on your plate, so. If it's okay, I, I will leave with that, but thank you all very much. Thanks okay. for having I think, me. Uh, Curtis, did you wanna say one thing before Monica leaves? Well, um, Monica, since you're here and, you know, since you're the uh, world renowned ID expert and maybe you can make a comment on it rather than me later. But, you know, just, you know, um, just to Nancy's point, if you can describe just uh, a week and a half ago from New England Journal of Medicine about the um, efficacy of Pfizer after one dose, after they waited for, I think, 21 days instead of seven to 14 days. Are you aware of that one or? Yeah, so um, so the, the, it it came out in print yesterday, so I didn't even get it on my slides. But it's um, ninety, it's ninety four percent effective against severe disease um, after two doses. So I'm I'm saying two doses and not one um, in the New England Journal study. Now, I mean that is mirroring what we saw in the uh, clinical trials. So that's what I mean where effectiveness is approaching efficacy, like what's happening in the real world. And then there was more, um, the, the important thing about the Pfizer New England Journal study is also the swabbing of the noses. So the, um, so that, you know, that some people are still testing after being vaccinated, which I think won't be indicated, um, uh, after, you know, with all this good data that it blocks viral transmission in your nose. And even asymptomatic infection, you know, even having it in your nose at all was blocked by 85% in the Pfizer data, in the Pfizer New England Journal study. So asymptomatic, symptomatic, and importantly, what landed us into trouble, uh, we're, we're approaching 100% efficacy. And then there's, against mild disease, there's more, um, there's more variability. That's so perfect. Thank you for your leadership throughout the state. And thank you for spending the evening with us in San Mateo County. So thank you very much. San Mateo County is my favorite county. I think I already <laughs> told you that because I think you guys are doing a great job. Now, I think the health officers are, I don't know, they speak with a lot of compassion. And um, I really, I like San Mateo County. If I could, I'd move there. <laughs> great. Thank you. Hey, Monica. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So we're going to switch over, um, Dr. Chabra. Um, so um, a lot of what we're celebrating today is through your leadership as um, the director of the vaccination operation in San Mateo County. Um, I do want to share that um, there's been no rest for anybody who's had anything to do with distributing vaccine um, to the public. And um, I imagine that um, the Board of Supervisors has a nice, long um, Caribbean vacation planned for you at some point. Oh, I hope. I hope. <laughs> well, if not, I think we'll all take up a collection um, and have you send us pictures because it's well-deserved. You work, your work is so um, appreciated. Thank you so much, Superintendent. Um, it's really a huge team effort, so um, you know, I have wonderful people I'm working with and I get to be on on stage a little bit but they're doing a lot of the work well um you know we've been working together as we've been trying to coordinate uh, yeah. vaccinations for educators and boy I've really learned so much and um one thing is it's really hard to translate out to the public exactly all the rules and regulations and the changing and of things and how quickly the landscape changes and trying to keep everybody up to speed. So um, I do have some, some things to share tonight that are just brand new that came into my inbox today from the governor um, regarding education. But I'm wondering if you wouldn't just kind of give us sort of an overview of the channels through which vaccine is being distributed in San Mateo County right now. Oh, certainly happy to do that, Superintendent. Um, 
So since vaccine became available, and as Dr. Gandhi mentioned, um, it first started with the Pfizer vaccine and then with the Moderna vaccine, and we hope very shortly to have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, there have been three major routes, and then I'll mention some other routes through which vaccines have been available. So you have um, the big organizations, and they've called these the multi-county entities, but Basically, that's the Kaiser Permanente system, um, the Sutter system, which includes Palo Alto Medical Foundation. We have a lot of members in the county. And then some smaller ones, such as um, Dignity Health, which includes Sequoia Hospital and Seton Medical Center is part of one called AHMC. So these have gotten their own supply of vaccine from the state government. Separate from that, um, counties have received an allocation of vaccine from the government, the state government. And we, the, in turn, either directly administer vaccines like you know, some of the events um, at the Cemetery Event Center in San Francisco Airport, or we pass it on to smaller medical providers. So um, those might be pharmacies, uh, they might be clinics like Ravenswood or you know, Chinese hospital up in North County, as well as lots of um, smaller medical practices. Uh, and then finally, there is a, a federal, direct federal route, a federal stream of vaccine going to um, some pharmacies. And in California, it's been to Walgreens and to CVS, and they have been directly vaccinating um, in long-term care facilities. So nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, other kinds of what we call congregate or group facilities, either for elderly people or for people with disabilities. So those have been the three major routes so far that vaccine has come you know, to San Mateo County. And now there's some new routes where this federal vaccine coming directly to your neighborhood pharmacies. So now we have seven neighborhood pharmacies in uh, San Mateo County that are getting direct vaccine from the federal government and you can set up appointments and these include uh, Rite Aid and CVS in San Mateo County. We don't have, some other counties have Walgreens as well doing that, but we don't have that yet in San Mateo County. So those are some of the mechanisms, but it's quite a, a complicated stream of vaccine coming different routes. Right. And um, so as we work together to try to organize how we would uh, um, approach distribution to educators, most of that conversation was in the context of not enough vaccine supply. Definitely. Um, and so, you know, you can have all the plants in the world, but if you don't have any food to serve for dinner, right. people are going to go away hungry, right? <laughs> so, um, do you see the vaccine supply um, starting to flow a little bit differently? Is, is there a difference between now and say four weeks ago? Yeah, it, it's been interesting because it's been a bit of an up and down, uh, you know, just sort of a little bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, so this week, for example, um, we received San Mateo County Health received just under 9,000 new doses of vaccines. That's not a lot of vaccine for you know, 800,000 people, give or take, in the county. Um, so, and the Kaisers and the Sutters have gotten even less than we have as county health. So there's definitely a shortage of supply still. Okay. Um, you know, just to give people a sense, um, basically 21% of the adults, and I'm defining adults as 16 and older, basically the people who are actually eligible to receive vaccine right now, 21% um, have received at least one dose uh, of vaccine. And we're doing a lot, you know, when we talk about people 65 and older, that's 62% have received it. When we talk about people 75 and older, 70% have received at least one dose. So that's really good because they're at the, some of the highest risk groups for right, right. ending up in the hospital or, or dying, unfortunately, from COVID. Mm -hmm. um, 
but if we're at 21% now and it's almost March, um, it's, you know, with this level of supply, it's gonna take a while um, to get everybody vaccinated. I think we'll see slight increases. I don't know if we're gonna see massive increases for a while. It may be a number of, I'm hoping that we'll start to see a bigger flow, but I haven't quite seen that yet. Yeah. Well, San Mateo County Health has been such an incredible partner. Um, just yesterday, we were able to vaccinate uh, almost 3,000 um, in our education workforce yeah. in one day yeah. um, at the event center. We have another maybe 300 coming in tomorrow, 400. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, we're, we're broadening out our avenues next week. Kaiser has in, um, stepped up their timeline with us. Okay. They were going to get started with us on March 8th, and now they're looking to put something together for next week. So we're oh. going to open up another pathway there. And mm -hmm. then, um, like I said, the governor um, has announced a, um, a commitment to um, dispersing 10% of the statewide vaccine supply to right. the education workforce across the state, mm -hmm. which uh, according to the governor's office equals about 75,000 doses. Yeah. And right. what, we, what we learned um, just today is how that's gonna work is the county mm -hmm. offices are going to receive a certain number of single use codes mm -hmm. um, that people can um, use to sign up for an appointment on the My Turn app. And so we will work, um, as you know, we have a priority list based on an equity model um, for all of our educators in San Mateo County, including our public and charter schools, our independent mm -hmm. schools and our private schools. Um, and uh, we're implementing that beautifully. We feel really, um, honored that um, it's working well. Mm -hmm. And so once we have a, an additional channel of these codes, that will just be, again, an additional uh, stream right. that we're able to allot to um, the education community to help us keep marching forward. So um, uh, I uh, predict that many of our school districts that have been slower to open with caution about the level of um, COVID-19 spread mm -hmm. inside their local communities um, are now starting to plan for opening dates in April. Mm -hmm. And the vaccine is driving those decisions in a really big way. So um, speaking of back to school, yeah, right? We, uh, let's say we've got our educators um, vaccinated. Um, mm -hmm. We, there's still a lot of question about what does that mean when we are implementing safe protocols in a school. So um, one question is about, uh, you know, that people will still need to wear masks and physically distant. Definitely. Um, and, and I know that Dr. Gandhi was talking about, you know, in England, they're going to start partying <laughs> in May, right? right. Um, in the in the USA, you know, do you see any way into the future? Will we start our new school year masking and distancing? Is that a too tough a question? Well, I, I don't know if it's too tough a question. I think it's a hard one to really know the answer to. Um, I, I don't think we'll be partying in May. <laughs> I'm pretty sure about that. Yeah. Um, you know, just given the amount of vaccine and the pace at which we're going. And, you know, I will say everyone's, you know, moving as fast as we possibly can, of course. Um, and the major limitation really is just vaccine supply rather than anything else. We have lots of volunteers. We have lots of people who want to help with vaccination. We have lots of sites. Um, we just don't have enough vaccine to make it all work. That's right. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we might be in a much better situation during the summer. And I think the fall is, is an open question. Um, if the vaccines are as effective against the variants as we hope they will be, 
and if enough people accept vaccination, because I think that's another factor. Um, you know, I, I think there may be more vaccine hesitancy in the United States than there might be in other parts of the world. Um, and I think people need to feel comfortable, need to feel that the vaccines um, you know, are safe, which we know they are, but also they may need to see their neighbor get it and you know, see their friends get it and see that they're doing just fine and even better, they're protected because they chose to be vaccinated. And then, um, so I think some people may take a little longer to get there. Obviously we want everyone to be vaccinated who's eligible. And right now, obviously we're going down priority groups, but ultimately it will be anyone who meets the you know, Food and Drug Administration criteria age-wise to be, to be vaccinated. Yeah. Um, and I think we, we could get there by end of June well, that's music to my ears. I'm, you know, I'm a music fan, so we'll just celebrate <laughs> right, right. that tune right now. Um, so two things that we're doing in schools right now to ensure safety. One is um, surveillance testing or COVID-19 testing. When um, someone is vaccinated, um, I have heard that they would still continue to participate in COVID-19 testing. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. And I, I don't, I can't really say I know the answer to that. I don't think probably the big processes would change for a you know, population of teachers until a sufficient volume of that, you know, that group is vaccinated and then things might change at that point. I think while we're in these transition periods with, you know, 20% of the general population vaccinated and, you know, working through different populations, I think we have to keep these public health measures in place. And then when a sufficient volume of people are vaccinated, some of those can change. Um, but that's sort of a general answer. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. I, I imagine it, your answer might be similar if I asked you about um, the quarantine rules. So if someone qualifies as a close contact, for instance, and they were also vaccinated, um, will the public health guidance be to implement the 14-day quarantine? Yeah, so the CDC has come out with some specific guidance around that. Um, and you know, for people who are fully vaccinated, um, so that means they've gotten their two doses of the two-dose vaccines, and it's been at least two weeks or 14 days after their second dose, between that period and three months from vaccination, if they get an exposure and they have no symptoms, the CDC says they don't need to quarantine. Unless, and this, there are some exceptions to that if you're hospitalized and other you know, particular situations, but for the average person in that situation um, and without symptoms, they, per the CDC, would not need to quarantine. Right. Obviously, every institution will also need to make their own decisions too, but that would be the public health guidance. Great. Well, that's, um, that's good to know because um, that is one of the strains on the school system is um, when someone has to quarantine, then we have a substitute. We have to fill with a substitute if we're in person. And our, um, our workforce is thin. Our substitute workforce is even thinner. Right. So there's been concern that um, back in November and December, um, when the case rates were high, um, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of administrators in classrooms <laughs> teaching classes. Right, right. Instead of substitutes. <laughs> Substituting, right. right. Yeah. So um, th thinking about kids, you know, um, mm -hmm. teenagers age 16, mm -hmm. Uh, um, can receive the vaccine when their turn comes. Right. And um, I, I wonder about um, what kind of public health messaging there will be to encourage, um, say, the, the transitional age youth, the 16 to 25 year olds to get vaccinated who may still be in that um, illusion that they're untouchable somehow. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's definitely 
uh, broad public health messaging that we're doing to the general population and then to specific subpopulations. I think when, as you say, when their turn comes um, and you know the healthy 16, if, if it's Pfizer vaccine or 18, if it's Moderna vaccine year old um, is eligible, um, we'll definitely be looking at all kinds, whether it's social media mechanisms, you know, text-based education, you know, um, other forms of media, things that will get out to that population to really encourage it. And I think a lot of the message is also about protecting the people in your life, right? So certainly young people can get quite sick, though it's much rarer than older people, um, but they usually have you know, parents around or grandparents around or other loved ones around that they need to protect and who may or may not be vaccinated. And some people, you know, because of allergic reactions and other things can't be vaccinated. And so a lot of that I think will be also about protecting the community and protecting the loved ones in your life who may be at greater risk than you are. Right, and what a great um, school project going back to school mm -hmm. for young people to you know, research and provide um, uh, ideas about how to share this message with their peers and um, do the peer-to-peer -peer communication. I think that's a great idea for any of our school leaders. In the same vein as, um, you know, those 16 and 17 year olds getting vaccinated, um, I do want to be clear that when we're talking about the school environment and vaccinations and protecting those who are working, it includes every single worker who's in the education space, whether you are um, a bus driver, a food service worker, a paraprofessional, uh, a schoolyard um, you know, supervisor, uh, an after-school coach, um, an IT professional. So uh, I want the, all those listening to know that our um, priority criteria list includes all of those kinds of folks working in support of our schools. Um, uh, because we're talking about protecting the community. And I think that speaks to the herd immunity idea that Dr. Gandhi was thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, uh, a couple technical questions um, that are coming up here. One is about um, um, Dr. Gandhi sort of indicated that these T cells um, live on for a while. And, and do we know yet if there would be a, a booster shot necessary down the road for these vaccines or, or is that something still in research and trial? Yeah, I, I would say that's more in the research realm right now. Um, and the other physicians here may want to chime in more on that later, but um, I know there's been talk about a booster shot for the Johnson & Johnson, uh, even though that's not part of their initial um, application to the Food and Drug Administration, but there has been discussion that that may be beneficial. Um, and I've heard something similar around the Pfizer vaccine. So um, I think those are things that are being researched and looked at, uh, but I don't think there's de definitive answers on those at this point in time. Right. Well, I'm also going to go back and, you know, revisit my, um, did I, 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 I've been thinking this all day, actually, I've been thinking this all week about simply how lucky we are to even be having a webinar about a vaccine for COVID-19. It's amazing. That it was less than a year ago that COVID yeah. hit the globe. Right. And um, it's a, quite a tribute to our medical researchers and scientists oh. that we're actually putting vaccine in people's arms for protection of their life. Yeah. Um, so I just wanna thank all of you for everything you do and offer up, um, any other comments or questions for Dr. Chabra from Dr. Patel or Chan or Dr. Howard? Anything that you would add to, to the conversation about how we're applying the idea of vaccine to safe school openings? Dr. Howard. So, um, Dr. Chabra, one of the questions that always comes up is, uh, when will children be vaccinated? And um, uh, the, to me, that seems like a twofold question. It's sort of, um, 
timing and need relative to, to illness, um, and then uh, sort of age appropriateness of vaccination uh, based on what we know about our vaccine trials. Do you have any insight into those sorts of things? Um, yeah, so pretty limited information. I, I am aware that some of the trials are now extending down to age 12 um, for the existing vaccine. And so uh, clearly people are thinking about that. And I think it's definitely valuable to be looking at 12 and older since we kind of know that it seems like the middle school age is really when the risk, you know, of pretty low risk of younger children by and large, with some exceptions, um, relative to, you know, more of an adult risk that seems to happen around the middle school age. So I think it would be great if, you know, 12 to 16 or 12 to 18 year olds could eventually be vaccinated. Um, uh, but that that's kind of what I am aware of. And you may have other information on that. You know? <laughs> There, there is some, some um, feedback from um, the participants tonight about, um, again, the safety in being in school while COVID is still being transmitted in the community. And this is where um, we have real solid research about the fact that um, COVID-19 really is not transmitting in schools. Um, there are so many safeguards um, happening in our school communities that it really just um, um, blocks the all the ways in which that virus likes to jump from person to person, right? Yeah, and so, I mean, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, to, to what you were saying before, I think, you know, the continued practice of the, you know, masking and social distancing and, you know, not having the groups and being outside as much as possible um, and the health and hygiene measures in general, testing, et cetera, really makes the school setting and as we've talked in previous webinars, the you know, childcare setting, as long as those things are in place, quite safe in terms of you know, having actual outbreaks of COVID. The children who, who get COVID and they definitely do tend to get it at home or out in the community and not in school you know, not from the school and not from the childcare setting. That's and right. So, um, I think just remembering that and that that environment because people are being so so careful in the schools and the preschools and childcare um, is really um, a very safe environment based on all the information we have. Yeah. That's right. And the protocols, um, when someone is identified positive, um, the quarantine protocols are really strong followed very um, religiously, and we have not seen spread of COVID in schools. Um, there certainly people have come, been identified as positive um, and quarantined um, following all the guidance, but um, we have had no outbreaks in our, in our local schools. So um, in addition to the national um, research that's showing, I think the same kind of kind of thing. So um, it's just so, uh, uh, oh, Curtis? Like Curtis yeah, yeah I, I just want to appreciate uh, the great work the County Office of Education has done to implement those four pillars. Uh, but And, you know, I think Dr. Morrow was also emphasizing those four pillars early on. But, but also, I just want to recognize that those are based on uh, good modeling and hunches. And we didn't know for sure at that time. So it's okay that people were apprehensive about starting school. And really the evidence uh, just keeps on pouring in, but you know, we don't know the evidence back in October, what the experience of Wisconsin is going to be from August until November. So it takes until December for the CDC reports to come out to show that parts of the countries were safe using those uh, screened measures. So I just want to say that, you know, there's been very few outbreaks, very few transmission from students back to parents at home and back to grandparents. But, you know, I'm still a worry ward. You know, I've taken care of people with disabilities as a, as a physician. Yeah. So I have a question for Dr. Shabra. So I'm, I'm a worry ward still. I'm glad that most frail elderly 
who are the ones who are who are the grand majority of people who are dying mm. most of them have been immunized um, so for the families who have um, parents with severe disabilities or severe medical conditions when it when will it be their turn to get their um, vaccine I don't mean everybody with any chronic condition but just mm -hmm. Like that, that um, yeah, you know, what's, what's the approximate timeline for them to get the first dose? So the families of the people with disability, I mean, the- The uh, parents. Family members. Yeah, yeah, but like, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. The uh, parents, sorry. The parents of school children who are gonna be returning back home. Okay. Because this was a question from our um, December 12th webinar that um, a parent had from a disabilities community, I believe, you know, mm -hmm. somebody with severe medical condition, like somebody mm -hmm. who's ventilator dependent, mm -hmm. oh, who yeah, the CCS yeah. medical director takes care right. of, right. when are they going to, when is yeah. that parent going to get the vaccine? Yeah, yeah, so the new category that becomes eligible um, is going to be in March 15th, or that'll be the earliest date of eligibility. So just so you know, the, the phases for everyone. So the first phase of vaccination was called phase 1A, and that was healthcare workers and residents of long-term care facility, any kind of congregate group facility for elderly or disabled. Then we have phase 1B, and in San Mateo County and throughout the state, we started with six folks 65 and older. Some places started 75 and older. Um, and then in San Mateo County, we moved into the second part of phase 1B, just you know, a couple of days ago on the 22nd, and that was to include educators. So all the people that Superintendent McGee mentioned, um, childcare workers, uh, workers in the food industry, in the agriculture industry, and then any first responders that weren't part of the phase 1A, you know, the medical first responders. So that's where we are right now in terms of vaccination. March 15th, assuming enough vaccine is available, um, there's a whole other group of folks who are in the 16 to 64 age group. So anyone 16 to 64, because that's who's eligible for vaccine right now, who has certain medical conditions. So they could have a significant disability. Um, they might have, you know, diabetes that is not super well controlled. Um, they might have sickle cell anemia and their whole body, there's a whole list of conditions. You know, if they have lung disease or, um, you know, and they, they need uh, assistive device for breathing, um, if they have significant heart issues, that kind of thing, they will be eligible for vaccination. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean that there's more vaccine available. It just means there's another group that's eligible. So it's, it's great that that group will be eligible and it really becomes a question of, okay, now we have more groups of people eligible and maybe the same amount of vaccine or just a little bit more than we had before. But March 15th is the date when that goes into effect. Um, and at least from a state perspective um, that those groups are eligible. Thank you, that's really helpful. So um, Dr. Patel, do you have a question? We're gonna get ready to wrap up. So we're also, if you have any final um, thoughts or reflections, that would be great. Um, sure, I just wanted to ask uh, Dr. Chabra for clarification on, and I think for Dr. Chan's question, um, parents of um, certain children with uh, extreme disability um, or uh, diagnoses such as Down syndrome or epilepsy um, or cerebral palsy, my understanding is those parents are eligible as caregivers now, is that correct? That, that, is, that is correct, yeah. So for Dr. Chan's question, I was speaking to the adults' eligibility based on their own medical conditions. But yes, to your point, um, if the child has a significant medical disability, Down syndrome, um, you know, basically any significant condition where the parent has to function as a caregiver for that child beyond normal parenting kinds of responsibilities. That parent is eligible as a healthcare worker. They're considered a healthcare worker for vaccine purposes. Of course, they may not be paid for, to do this, um, but they meet that cat category. And so they've been eligible for a while. 
but they don't always know that they're eligible. And so definitely please share that with those parents if there's some question, because despite the messaging we try to share that those folks are indeed eligible, it still comes up that they aren't aware. So it'd be good to share that. So Dr. Patel, did you have anything else to add before we say goodnight? Sure, I did uh, want to just uh, have a moment uh, on my end, close with a moment of reflection. Um, so as we take a chance to really reflect on what a moment we are at in, with this pandemic, um, I wanted to just uh, briefly say something about the history of vaccines. The practice of immunization dates back hundreds of years. Um, in the past, Buddhist monks have drank snake venom to confer immunity to snake bites. Uh, cowpox was smeared on a skin tear to confer immunity, immunity to smallpox in 17th century China. Um, in, in, in Western history, Edward Jenner is considered the founding or the father of vaccines um, in the mid 18th century when he inoculated an eight year old boy with cowpox uh, from the blister of the hand of an English uh, milkmaid. Um, so the Pfizer, and I just want to make, uh, really reflect on how, what a miracle the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are. It's brand new mRNA technology that will ultimately, that will ultimately lead to the control, um, or at least significantly help to control this pandemic, uh, which happens once in a lifetime, we hope. Um, to the audience, thank you for your interest in today's program and giving us your time um, and bothering to understand the science and to help think how we will overcome the pandemic. Um, through vaccine and beyond. Um, understanding the benefits and the shortcomings of the vaccines, getting the vaccines, encouraging others to get the vaccines is gonna be really essential and it'll take all of us um, to do this together um, as we march to what we think is our new normal. So I just wanna um, uh, speak to the notion of hope. To me, you know, the COVID vaccines, they may, certainly Dr. Gandhi um, uh, strongly endorses that this is the solution to the pandemic. But for me, it's definitely, whether we agree with that or not, it's a symbol of hope that is grounded in science and leads us towards this vision um, that Edward Jenner captured. And so I'm just gonna end on a quote from Edward Jenner. He said about um, when he was writing about the smallpox vaccine, in our, in our case, it's SARS-CoV-2. Quote, while vaccine discovery was progressive, the joy I felt at the prospect before me of being the instrument destined to take away the world uh, of one of its greatest calamities, blended with the fond hope of enjoying independence and domestic peace and happiness, I have sometimes found myself in a kind of reverie. Those were a lot of fancy words, but what he reminds us is that the COVID vaccine can help us to get back what COVID has really taken from us, our independence, and in some cases, our happiness and domestic peace. The ultimate outcome is to get to our, to, the ultimate outcome to get to our new normal, uh, perhaps is through the vaccines, and which is important uh, for the safe reopening of schools. Here, here. Thank you, Dr. Patel. And I would say that um, the health, well being, and progress of our children are really at stake here. That the impacts of prolonged further absence from school will be um, potentially lifelong. And so it, it does take all of us, we are better together, circling up around our children. Um, I wanna thank, um, thank you, Dr. Chabra, so much for your time and energy. Thank you, Dr. Patel and Dr. Chan for your support, Dr. Howard for um, your participation and support. Um, Dr. Chan, did you wanna add any last, uh, Last thoughts before we sign off tonight. There's two minutes left, so I'll take one minute. So I just want to thank County Office of Education for bringing together all the school districts, all the school leaders together. Uh, I think we've gone through the hardest parts, and you know we've come up and we've made a lot of progress together. Um, the vaccine and the surge, the surge has passed. The vaccine is upon us. Uh, we can em emerge definitely stronger together. So this is really a monumental time. I just want to thank Dr. Shabra again for his overall leadership for the county. He's doing so, he's juggling so many different things. He's really amazing and calm and such an incredible leader. 
I want to also clarify from, you know, um, Dr. Gandhi's perspective. I mean, she is, I think you, you mentioned that she sounds optimistic and she's definitely in the press a lot. And, but she's all, she's, uh, she, all her comments are completely science-based. Many, she, her opinions reflect uh, the opinions of many of the health officers across the Bay. And I think her optimism and, and her predictions are pretty close to what we think would be, I mean, not the Europe predictions, but it's pretty close to what many of the public health officers are thinking. We're not saying it yet because we don't want things to be, um, overly interpreted, um, but there is a lot of optimism because uh, with all the older people who are vaccinated, many of the people with um, severe medical conditions being vaccinated, you know, starting in March, on March 15th, uh, we're not, this is not going to be a deadly disease hardly anymore. It's going to be a nasty bug for many of us, but for many of us, but we're not going to have this, these huge surges of hospitalizations and deaths that we've had. So we've come a long way together. So now it's a good time to rescue our children and rescue each other's family members. So I just want to thank you again, um, Nancy and your, and, your, and your entire team as well too. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa Mendeville for uh, translating for us tonight and some very difficult vocabulary, I imagine, <laughs> in Spanish. I, I wouldn't have made it through on that. Uh, Dr. Gandhi's presentation, but thank you all of the attendees. Um, everybody stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you next time. March 16th, uh, we'll be better together. <laughs>